The colors blur together, creating a coagulation of static and shadow on the screen. I cursed silently under my breath, removing the cartridge from the Nintendo 64 and inspecting it with an impatient eye. I couldn't see anything wrong with it, but this was the third time the game had frozen on me. I blew into the seams of the cartridge, trying to dislodge any dust that might have been stuck in there, then put it back into the console. Before I could boot up the system again, the door to my bedroom jerked open. How many times have I told you to knock? I muttered, without taking my eyes off the screen, waiting for the game to load. Sorry, sorry, my dad said calmly as he leaned his heavy frame against the doorway. Just came to see if you're alright. All ready for prom? I frowned, my fingers resting against the controller without pressing anything. I... I don't think I'm going after all. From the corner of my eye, I saw my dad's eyebrows come together, casting a shadow over his face. What do you mean? Well, I mean, my friends want to blow off prom to have a game night instead. I figured I might as well join him. Sounds more fun anyway. I cleared my throat, brushing a fleck of dirt off the controller. You want to skip prom to play video games, which you can do any other day. He pointed out, and I shrugged, sheepish. Do you really not want to go? I don't know. I admitted. I feel like everyone makes it out to be a big deal when it's not. I'll probably just forget about it in a few weeks. My dad sighed heavily, stepping further into the room. Prom's more than just one night. It's an event you'll remember for years after. I know my prom night was definitely a night to remember. He said. I shuffled up along the bed to make room for him to sit next to me. We rarely had these sorts of father and son talks, so I stared down at my feet, not really knowing what to say. You don't have to go if you don't want to, but you might end up regretting it for the rest of your life. He continued. His frame was towering beside mine, and I almost felt like a kid again, standing in his shadow. Like I said, my experience is one I still remember. I don't think I'll ever forget it. I was the man of the moment. He chuckled quietly to himself, lost in reminiscence. I was one of the only guys who went without a date. He said, much to my surprise. I flicked a glance towards his face and found him grinning, a childish, unruly sort of grin that I'd come to expect from my dad. But boy, did that work out in my favor. I ended up at the end of the night with more numbers than I can count on one hand. Anyway, it was a great night. Well, apart from one unfortunate tragedy at the start of the night. Tragedy? I asked, my voice thick. My dad looked away, seeming to regret bringing it up. Yeah, one of the students died in a car crash on the way to prom. It was horrible. I remember hearing the sirens. Geez, Dad, someone died? And you're trying to convince me that prom's great? He grimaced. That's not what I meant. It was horrible. I knew the girl, even tried asking her out once, but she completely blew me off. She was one of the popular ones, you know? I can't even remember her name now, but everyone was still talking about it months after it happened. It even got the attention of the media. I can't remember how many times the school got interviewed by different news crews. It all got a bit out of hand, really. His voice had turned bitter, and I decided to change the topic. Well, anyway, I'm still not decided, I said. I'll see how I feel on the day. I still have a week to decide. Dad nodded and gave my hair a playful ruffle. I swatted him away. Good. You never know who you might meet on prom night. So think about it, okay? I nodded, and he left the room, leaving me in silent contemplation. A week had passed, and the night of prom was dreary. It had rained all day, painting the city in shades of dirt and grime, and a hazy mist had eddied into the streets out of nowhere souring my mood as I looked out the window. My reflection in the glass was streaked with fat droplets of rain and full of shadows. My fingers slipped once more, and the tie skewed into a knot. I threw up my hands with a huff. 
I'd been trying for almost 10 minutes and I still couldn't get it on properly. Need some help? I said nothing, letting him fix the tie with practiced movements. Thanks, I muttered, straightening it up as I caught my reflection again in the glass. I felt stupid. The suit was slightly too big around my shoulders, and there were shadowy crevices beneath my eyes from staying up late. I'd been unable to sleep last night, so I'd ended up playing video games until well past midnight. You all ready? Dad asked, a grin in his voice. I shrugged without looking at him. I still wasn't exactly enthusiastic about going, but my dad had seemed excited for me, and I didn't want to disappoint him. Come on, don't look so gloomy. Loosen your face. Give me a smile. I rolled my eyes, but tucked my lips into a slight smile, and my dad nodded approvingly. There we go, he said, chuckling as he took a picture. I'm sure you'll have a great time. Oh, and don't forget these. He reached into his pocket and withdrew his car keys, jingling together softly. I started in surprise, staring at the car keys he held out to me. He never let me drive his car. Thanks, I said, taking them from him. Not a scratch, he warned, and no drinking and driving. I scoffed. I was underage anyway. And please be careful. I don't want little Davids running around next year. I'm not ready to become a grandpa just yet. I flushed fiercely at the insinuation, my ears going hot beneath my hair. Yeah, I know, Dad. Right then, we've wasted enough time. Go say bye to your mom and get going. The evening was humid after the rain shower, and a bead of sweat clung to the nape of my neck as I drove to the prom venue. Mist congealed around the corners of the streets, forming strange illusions beneath the hazy glow of the street lamps so I took it slow. The clock on the dashboard read 7.48, which meant I was later than I'd thought. I just hoped that wouldn't make things too awkward. I was lucky enough to find a parking spot not too far from the entrance. There were still a couple of students loitering outside, girls in bright, fancy dresses, and guys in suits. I didn't recognize some of them, others I'd glimpsed only occasionally around school. It was fair to say I wasn't exactly a social butterfly. I could hear the music before I made it inside, thrumming through the walls of the building. More sweat gathered along my back, and I wiped a hand nervously through my hair, already feeling the regret cement itself in my stomach like a stone. Why hadn't I agreed to the game night? I'd much rather be there than here, in a place I didn't belong with people out of my reach. I slipped into the shadows of the room almost as soon as I got inside. The dance floor was a crush of bodies, and the music was already hurting my ears. I noticed a couple of lone figures throughout the room, girls waiting for a dance, but I could hardly muster the courage to go up to them, never mind ask them to dance with me. Most of the night was passed beneath the shadowy eaves of the room. I felt like some kind of ghost lingering in the gloom, watching everyone have fun while I was stuck there. In a limbo of anxiety and loneliness, I might as well have been invisible. I was starting to feel stifled lingering in the corner of the room and went for a walk around the outskirts, debating whether to just leave. So far, the night had been nothing like my dad had described. I was hoping that tonight I might finally meet someone who thought I was cool or fun or anything but the outcast I usually was. I was hoping that tonight... I might finally be seen. As I was trying to slip past the throng of students, my foot must have slid on the silky trail of someone's dress, because the next thing I knew, I was stumbling forwards. With the lights flashing above and undulating around me, I couldn't see where I was going, nor could I steady myself. My elbow hit something hard, a table, and I crumpled forward straight into the fondue fountain. Chocolate splashed up the front of my suit, some of it landing on the edge of my lips. Somehow, it tasted bitter and dark, and a shudder ran through me. A chorus of laughter immediately exploded around me, and my whole body fluctuated between hot and cold as embarrassment flooded my veins. 
I struggled to my feet, trying to wipe the chocolate off my clothes, but everyone was staring and laughing and pointing and I couldn't take it. Clenching my hands into fists, I shoved my way roughly through the gathered students, staring at the ground with hot tears blurring my vision. What a disaster. This had been nothing like my dad had told me. Why did I bother listening to him? I made it outside, feeling the damp breeze wash over my face, drying the chocolate on my clothes. I paused outside the building for a moment, trying to gather my thoughts. There was no way I could go back inside now. I might as well just go back home. I folded my arms across my chest, hoping to hide the mess, and was about to cross the road when a voice caught my attention. Hey. My steps faltered for a second, my heel almost catching the curb. I quickly recovered, stepping down out of the road. Hey, you. I stopped again, glancing behind me. A girl was staring at me. She had her hands in the pocket of a jacket she had draped over her shoulders. Beneath, she wore a simple ruffled dress. You all right? I blinked at her my lips opening and closing uselessly as it dawned on me that I was the target of her question. Yeah, I'm fine. Her eyes flickered down to the mess on my clothes, and I looked away, my ears going hot. Was she going to make fun of me too? They shouldn't have laughed at you. She continued, her voice sinking into a gentle murmur. I saw what happened. I didn't find it funny. My eyes darted back towards her, struggling to conceal my surprise. I shuffled a couple of steps closer, away from the road. Um, my name's David. I blurted out, pushing aside a strand of chocolate-smeared hair. Sorry. The girl laughed, a sound like bells in the night, and I found myself struck by how pretty she was. Although her outfit was far more casual than others I'd seen tonight, Something about the way she looked, beneath the pale glimmer of the moon, drew my attention. I'm Wendy, she said shortly, tilting her head slightly to offer me a smile. Want to go back inside with me? I dropped my gaze to my feet. How could I go back inside after everyone had seen me make a fool of myself? Don't worry about the others. It doesn't matter what they think. Let's just enjoy what's left of the night, okay? I found myself nodding, even as I felt uncertain. Why was a girl like her helping me anyway? I didn't even recognize her. I had at least passed familiarity with most of the students here, but I don't recall ever seeing a face like Wendy's before. She offered out her arm, and I took it tentatively, following her back inside. The lights inside had dimmed since the last time, causing a haziness around the room, and nobody spared me a glance as Wendy and I stepped onto the dance floor. I began to relax slightly, out of any immediate scrutiny, and focus on the girl in front of me. How did I end up with one of the prettiest girls I'd ever seen, after such a disastrous start to the evening, too? You don't have to be nervous, she said softly. Relax your arms. I did as she said, loosening my muscles as I kept my hands on her waist. There, you'll enjoy it more if you're relaxed, she said. I felt my face flush slightly, but for the first time that night, a smile fell naturally onto my lips. We were getting into the fourth song when Wendy's expression changed. Her face paled slightly beneath the glimmering spotlights, and I felt her freeze in my arms. I... I need to go. I stared at her, my lips parting with surprise. Why? I promised my dad I'd be home by midnight. I'm so sorry. He'll kill me if I'm late. I need to find my friends. They're supposed to take me home. She looked around her with frantic movements, her eyes scanning the faces around her. There was a frenzied panic to her that struck me off guard. Wait, wait. I'll help you find him. But I mean, I could always drive you home, if you want. Wendy's gaze returned to mine, and I suddenly noticed how bright her eyes were. Green, with little flecks of gold and brown. I cleared my throat, looking away, but she caught my hand. 
Her skin was surprisingly cool against the warmth of my palm. Thank you. That's very sweet. No problem. I replied. Wendy's hand still clasped in mine. We both headed back outside. I'd almost forgotten the whole incident with the chocolate fountain. Wendy's smile had whisked away all of the anxieties that had plagued me most of the night. As we reached the car, Wendy quickly slipped her hand out of mine and climbed into the front passenger seat. I went round to the driver's side and started up the engine. Where do you live? I asked. It's a bit of a difficult neighborhood to reach. I'll guide you, she said, gesturing for me to take the road straight ahead. So, uh, when did you start attending our school? I don't think I've really seen you around much. Really? She asked, her voice pinched with surprise. Then you must be living under a rock. Everyone knows me at school. I was actually going to ask where you've been. Oh, I said, squinting to see through the mist that swirled and eddied over the road like something alive. I mean, uh, my friends and I usually hang out in the quieter areas at school. I'm not really surprised if you haven't seen me. Wendy hummed quietly, and I reached over to switch on the fan as the window started to fog with white plumes of condensation. Turn left here. I glanced across at Wendy. Her voice had gone faint and stilted, almost as though she was uncertain, and there was a clamminess to her cheeks I hadn't noticed before. Hey, you okay? I asked. The pallor of her skin had gone waxen. She looked ill. Yeah. She didn't look at me. She kept her eyes straight ahead, but I could feel the whole mood shift into something sad and uneasy. You can just... just make a right over here. I followed her directions, winding through the serpentine roads of the neighborhood. Definitely not a place to find very easily. A soft sniffle caught my attention, and when I flicked another glance at Wendy, I saw a tear glistening on the ridge of her cheek. Had I upset her somehow, we'd been having such a good time. What had changed? Are you sure you're all right? Do you… you want me to pull over and talk? Maybe we could go get ice cream or something. She shook her head. It's okay. I need to be home before midnight, remember? Oh, right. Yeah, I muttered, glancing at the clock on the dashboard. It was almost 11.52. Silence webbed between us, and I shifted uncomfortably in my seat, trying to think of something to say. Just around this corner, she said, raking the back of her hand roughly over her cheek to wipe away the tear. I took the turn and pulled up outside the house. It wasn't what I'd been expecting, even under the shadow-bruised sky, I could see its drab facade. There were no lights on inside, and each window peered down at me, like vacant eyes. The driveway was clotted with weeds, some breaking up through the gravel and spreading thick cracks through it. There was no car park there. More weeds and thistles grew out of the bricks of the house, and a naked bulb swung from a porch rich of cobwebs. Something about the place seemed untouched, unloved. I almost felt reluctant to leave Wendy here. Well, um, we're here, I said, twisting my fingers nervously in my lap. Wendy unclipped her seatbelt and turned to face me. Her beautiful green eyes were still glistening with unshod tears. Thank you, David. I had a truly wonderful night. I just… I'm sad I won't get to experience a night like this again. Me too, but I'm sure we could have fun together another night. I said hopefully. After all, it's just a DJ and a dance floor. We could do something again, sometime. I said. Wendy smiled. I'd like that. She said gently, then flicked a glance towards the house. It loomed like a giant behind her, dreary and unwelcoming. I guess I'd better go. Goodbye, David. I… Uh, I can walk you to your door, I said quickly. 
I didn't want her to leave just yet. Oh, no. My dad would kill me if he saw. I'm sorry. It's okay. I said gently. Then, how about your number so that I can call you? Wendy smiled and reeled off her number from memory. I didn't have anything to write it onto, so I chanted it repeatedly in my head. Got it? She asked. I think so, I said, rubbing the back of my head. Okay, then. I guess I should go now. Yeah, well, hopefully I'll see you again, I said. She pushed open the car door without saying anything else and stepped out closing it gently behind her. When she glanced back to wave at me through the window, I noticed that her smile had turned sad again, slipping down at the corners. Then she headed up the drive, the moonlight casting an almost ethereal glow around her. Wanting to make sure she got inside okay, I waited in the car, watching as she went around the side of the house and then disappeared behind it. I wondered why she didn't use the front door, but I figured she might not have wanted to wake her dad. As soon as she was gone, I started up the engine and drove home. The morning broke upon another dark, overcast day. The events of the previous night were still fresh, and I went down to breakfast with a grin on my face. My dad was reading the paper, nursing a cup of steaming hot coffee in one hand, but set down both when I walked in. Good night then, eh? He asked, his eyes twinkling with his usual mischief. I shrugged, thinking of Wendy, the only girl to notice me the whole night. Something like that, I said. Oh, you know, I remember the name of that girl. It was bugging me all night. You know, the one that died. Dad, is that really important? Wendy. Her name was Wendy, he said and my body went cold. I don't know why, but it just wouldn't leave me alone. So anyway, there we are. Came to me this morning as I was reading the paper. Wendy Hollows. Poor girl. I swallowed, my throat suddenly feeling dry. Surely it was just a coincidence, right? There were probably dozens of people called Wendy in the area, and anyway, that was decades ago. There was no way. I left the kitchen before he could say anything else, hurrying back to my room. I'd scribbled Wendy's number down as soon as I'd gotten home last night. Maybe it was too soon to call her, but something about what my dad had said troubled me. Just hearing her voice would reassure me that I was just being silly. I dialed the number into the landline, but there was no dial tone. Just static, humming faintly in my ear. I frowned, punching the number in again. This time, a voice emerged through the static. It was an automated message telling me the number I'd dialed was no longer in use. Had Wendy given me a false number? Or had I simply remembered it wrong? Either way, I couldn't shake away the unease that something wasn't right. Slamming the phone back onto the cradle, I went back to the kitchen. Dad, can I borrow the car again this morning? You going somewhere? Yeah, I just want to check up on something. Aha, you mean someone, huh? Sure, just be careful. Thanks, I said, already throwing on a jacket as I grabbed the keys from the side. I'll be back later. My thoughts were in a whirl as I drove, trying to remember the way to Wendy's house. It was probably nothing, but something was bugging me about last night. Something she'd said... I'm sad I won't get to experience a night like this again. I was probably just reading into things too much, but something about the way she'd said it struck me as odd, and the fact she shared the same last name with the girl who died at my dad's prom. I turned the last corner, recognizing the azalea bushes growing from the property on the bend, and pulled the car to a stop. My heart thundered in my chest, every part of my body shuddered beneath a chill. The house was gone. There was nothing but an empty plot of land. Had I taken a wrong turn somewhere? Was this the wrong street, the wrong neighborhood? It didn't make sense, I was sure this was where her house was. 
Getting out of the car, my legs felt suddenly unsteady, and I had to lean against the door until the weakness passed. What was going on here? The Wendy that I met last night, was she not real? But how was that possible? I spotted the sign for a local liquor store up ahead and found myself walking towards it in a daze. The harsh jingle of a bell when I walked inside snapped me back to my senses, and I went up to the cashier. Excuse me, would you mind telling me what happened to the house that used to be there? I said, pointing to the empty plot through the window. The cashier gave me a funny look. He was an older man, maybe a few years over 50, and spoke with the voice of a smoker. Why, lad, there hasn't been a house there in years. It was knocked down some time ago for renovation. What about the previous owners? He shrugged. Last I heard, the family that lived there moved on after losing their child. My throat closed up, and I thanked the man in a stifled voice before making my way back to the car. Surely, he was talking about Wendy. The Wendy I met last night, and the same Wendy who had died all those years ago, on the night of her prom. That's why she'd been so upset last night. It was the last time she would ever get to experience a night like that. And she'd chosen to spend it with me.